This video will explore the second version of the StyleGAN model developed by researchers at NVIDIA. StyleGAN is famous for its unconventional generative adversarial network architecture, such as the use of adaptive instance normalization, a mapping network from the latent vector Z into W, and then the progressive growing of going from a 4x4 image up to 8x8, and then up, so on up to powers of 2, up to the high resolution generated image. StyleGAN version 2 is going to restructure the use of adaptive instance normalization, get away from progressive growing to get rid of the artifacts introduced in StyleGAN version 1, like these water droplet effects, and then fixed positions of eyes and uh, noses, and things like that with respect to generating these images. The authors are also going to introduce a perceptual path length normalization term in the loss function to improve on their already impressive latent space interpolation ability. Latent space interpolation describes the changes in the generated image when changing the latent vector z. So when you have small changes in this latent vector z, you want to have small semantic perceptual changes in the generated image. They're also going to introduce a deep fake detection algorithm to project the generated images back into latent space to try to see if you can attribute the generated image or the fake image to the network that created it, or maybe the data set that created it. I found this video from Robert Luxemburg on the StyleGAN version 2 Reddit page to be really interesting with respect to looking at how the latent space interpolation can be animated with the StyleGAN version 2 architecture. In this case, it's showing the uh, interpolations of that latent vector z that produces these generated images and showing how the latent space is so smooth that you can just kind of perturb the latent vector z and have these smooth transitions from image to image that result in these really interesting animations of the StyleGAN model. This video from one of the authors of the StyleGAN version 2 paper shows another really interesting characteristic of this model. In this case, they're combining the styles of the image on the left with the images up top to show how they can be, uh, so how you can take the latent vector that produces this image and the latent vector that produces these images and combine them to produce combinations of the semantic images with the latent vector codes. Before we dive into the changes in StyleGAN version 2, let's recap some of the characteristics of StyleGAN 1 that make it different from other generative adversarial network architectures. Most notable is this mapping network from the latent vector z into this w space. So the latent vector z is some random vector that is then passed through these eight fully connected layers and mapped into the w space. The w latent code is then used to control the features in the generative adversarial network, the generator part of it, by using these adaptive instance normalization layers. So basically what happens is the feature maps, they're normalized with the mean and variance parameters of the feature maps, whether it's a channel-wise thing or a feature map thing, and then they're also scaled by using the uh, W parameters and they're shifted by using the mean of the W uh, vector. So they're also, interestingly, they're using this progressive growing architecture. So first the model generates a four by four image. Then it, once it's done this successfully or the models converge, it generates eight by eight, 16 by 16, and does this on and on to break up the problem of generating a 1024 by 1024 image into these uh, sub problems that are more tractable and progressively grow to train the network and stabilize the training of it. They also introduce this perceptual path length uh, quality metric. So there aren't a lot of good quantitative metrics to evaluate uh, generated images from these generative models like generative adversarial networks. Some of them are like the Frechet inception distance, the inception score, or precision and recall, things that use pre-trained image classifiers to compare the statistics of these generated images with original uh, data points. The perceptual path length metric is sort of seeing how smooth the change is when you change the latent vector z, and then how semantically different the resulting image is. In StyleGAN version 1, they take the baseline of the progressively growing GAN with an FID score on the FFHQ dataset of 8.04 and they introduce things like the tuning of the bilinear up and down sampling, adding this mapping and the style part of having this adaptive instance normalization and the mapping network, and then they remove the traditional input so instead of starting from the latent vector z, it starts from a constant value. They add the noise inputs, which is that B pathway going into the style GAN, and they add this mixing regularization to bring the FID score down to 4.4. StyleGAN version 2 starts from this baseline StyleGAN and it adds things like weight demodulation, lazy regularization, path length regularization, getting away from progressive growing and then scaling up the capacity of networks to get this score down to 2.84. The changes to StyleGAN in version 2 were largely motivated by these artifacts that can be used to identify images generated from the StyleGAN architecture. Websites like whichfacesreal.com have a long list of these different artifacts that you can use to tell if an image was created by StyleGAN or if it was a real image. These kind of artifacts include these water splotches, these droplet-like effects that can be shown in the uh, images, and the authors of StyleGAN version 2 attribute this to the way that the adaptive instance normalization is structured. Another artifact is these phase artifacts. So they notice that as they scale up the image, as they walk along the latent space, these kind of features like uh, mouths and eyes are sort of fixed in place and they attribute this to the structure of the progressive growing and having these intermediate scales and these intermediate low resolution uh, maps that have to be used to produce images that fool a discriminator. 
Their video released with the paper shows examples of these droplet artifacts that they attribute to the way that the adapted instance normalization layer is structured. You can see these cases where these kind of uh, artifacts are introduced in the style GAN that can be used to tell if it's a generated image or a real image. Interestingly, they see that this artifact starts to arise at the 64 by 64 resolution scale and then persists all the way up to the 1024 by 1024 scale. Their video also shows examples of the phase artifacts introduced by progressive growing, where you have a strong location preference for these different features like mouths and eyes, and you can see how these uh, features are always fixed in place as they walk along this latent space Z. The first technical change they make in the StyleGAN version 2 architecture is to remove the normalization artifacts of these water droplet-like effects by restructuring the adaptive instance normalization layer. Adaptive instance normalization, or ADA-N, is one of the key components of the StyleGAN. It's used to have the latent vector W influence the features of the generator as it's generating an image. So the way that they do this is that the latent vector W controls these uh, scaling and shifting parameters of the normalization of these intermediate feature maps. So say you have this intermediate feature map that's say 3x3 three three, and you have four of these feature maps. You might do some kind of normalization where you take a channel-wise mean and variance, so you might go along the spatial location along all the channels and normalize each of the values by taking the channel-wise statistics or you might do it within its own feature map. So say taking the mean and variance from this feature map. So what they're doing is they're separating the normalization of the own feature map. So this, this is like say the feature map that comes out of like a three by three convolution in the generator architecture. And they're gonna normalize this by integrating the parameters from that W latent code. The first change the authors describe is to separate out the addition of the Gaussian noise B with the adaptive instance normalization layer, citing that these might have conflicting interests and might sort of block each other out. So they separate that, this out into these style blocks pictured in the gray. So now the next idea is to get away from adaptive instance normalization and instead use these weight demodulation layers. So the idea here is that you scale the parameters by using this S sub I from the uh, adaptive instance normalization from this W latent vector, and then you demodulate it to assume that the features have unit variance by doing this kind of a cal calculation and changing the weight parameters of the three by three convolutional layer instead of having this intermediate modulation layer and normalization layer. Their video shows an ablation of what this style mixing would look like if you remove the weight demodulation. So without the weight demodulation, you see these odd artifacts introduced with respect to mixing the styles between these images and these images. The next technical change that the authors make to StyleGAN version 2 is to add perceptual path length regularization to the loss function of the generator. The high level idea of perceptual path length is to have changes in the latent vector Z not result in too dramatic of the changes in the generated image. So if you slightly change this latent vector Z, you want it to be a smooth change in the semantics of the generated image rather than having a completely different image generated with respect to a small change in the latent vector Z. The authors argue for the use of the perceptual path length image quality metric compared to things like the FID score or precision and recall. And one interesting paper that they cite for this is this paper, ImageNet trained CNNs are biased towards texture, increasing shape bias improves accuracy and robustness. So one shortcoming of these uh, automated GAN quality metrics, like things like FID, inception score, or precision and recall, is that they're using these pre-trained image classifiers that are biased towards texture detection rather than shape detection. So they show cases like this example of the uh, bottom 10% and the uh, top 90% of the cases where low uh, perceptual path length scores are highly correlated with our human judgment of the quality of these images. You see these images look much more like cats than these ones do. In the appendix of the paper, the authors further provide these grids of images that have similar FID scores, but different perceptual path length scores. And you can see that the groups of images with the lower perceptual path length scores generally are better images according to our own sense of the quality of these images. You can also see this case with the Elson cars data set and the quality of the generated images. They have similar FID scores of 3.27, but then the perceptual path length score of these, this grid of images is 1,485 compared to 437. And you can visually inspect these images for yourself to sort of see the, you know, the use of this automated GAN quality metric of the perceptual path length score. The way they implement perceptual path length regularization is a little bit confusing, but the high level overview is what they're doing is they have this Jacobian matrix J sub W, which is sort of seeing the partial derivatives of the output with respect to these small changes in the latent vector that produces the images. So they use the small changes and this Jacobian matrix of seeing how much these small changes change the image and they're multiplying it by a random image Y. And I think the image Y is, is randomly sampled at each iteration to avoid having some kind of a spatial location dependency introduced by this Y. So then they take the L2 norm of this kind of a matrix and they subtract it by an exponential moving average of this. 
and they do this in order to regularize the perceptual path length and make sure that the you know changes in the latent vector z aren't reduced aren't resulting in these dramatic changes in the generated image although sort of the way that this is implemented it's a little bit confusing for me so the lazy regularization idea is that this kind of a regularization algorithm computing the jacobian matrix with respect to the latent vector is a very computationally heavy process so what they find is that they can only add this to the loss function every 16 steps so Usually the generator is still just trained with that, uh, you know, maybe it's a logistic loss, a loss or scene loss, something like that. And then they have like the R1 regularization, and then they add this kind of a lazy regularization, and they say in the paper about adding it about once every 16 steps. So they're not doing the regularization on every step of the training. The final change to StyleGAN version 2 described in the paper is to get away from progressive growing. Shown here is the scheme for doing progressive growing and progressive growing of GANs. So basically once the uh, network has finished generating 16 by 16, maybe it's converged or some criterion that I'm not exactly sure of, what they do is they add in a new layer to generate 32 by 32 images, and then they upsample the previously generated image up to 32 by 32, and then they do the element Y sum, weighting them both by this alpha and one minus alpha parameter. So one problem with this already is that there's a lot of hyperparameter search with respect to alpha and one minus alpha that goes with respect to each scale, so four by four to eight by eight to 16 by 16, and so on. So additionally, this just complicates training a lot. It's not really a fun thing to implement, and it's sort of a, you know, sort of a bottleneck of this kind of architecture. So a recent paper, Multiscale Gradient GAN, looks at a different way of taking advantage of the uh, tractability that is enabled by having this multi-scale gradient, and what they do is they sort of enforce these intermediate feature maps in the generator that's almost like a DC GAN type of architecture by taking this out and then projecting it into an image and then sort of providing this as additional features to the discriminator. So this multi-scale gradient uh, GAN paper has really inspired their modification in the style GAN version 2. From the paper in StyleGAN version 2, this shows their modification to get away from progressive growing. So they don't take the same exact technique of the multi-scale gradient where they're using these intermediate features to uh, have additional features to the discriminator. Rather, what they're doing is they're having sort of a ResNet style architecture, and they have these two different schemes where they have the input-output skip and then the residual network type of architecture, and the difference between them is actually really subtle. It can be a little hard to see, but basically the idea is that in this case, you have, say, the 256 by 256 uh, generated the feature maps at this stage of the generator in, in, you know, in the processing from random vector into generated image. And you take this out, you convert it to an RGB by basically doing like a one by one convolution that'll flatten the feature maps from, say, it was 256 by 256 by 64. You then flatten it into three channels, so RGB. And then you sum this up by, and then do the upsampling, sum it up to the next level, and do this kind of processing. Differently in the ResNet, what you're doing is when you sort of isolate out this intermediate feature map, and then you do the upsampling with the convolutional layers, and then you just do the element-wise addition this way. So I suppose the key difference is that the ResNet has more of a direct, the previous feature maps have more of a direct impact on the future maps. But overall, they're going to do an ablation that we'll look at next, and the ablation kind of shows that, you know, it, there's really not much of a difference between the skip and the residual in, in you know, in the resulting image quality. Getting away from the aggressive growing model is sort of saying, what about the stability introduced with the multi-scale training? Because breaking up the high resolution image generation problem into these tractable subscales of 4x4, 8x8, 16x16 makes the problem much easier and results in having less of a, like a collapse in the training of these models. So what this show here is the contribution of each of these layers when they have this kind of a ResNet. So the ResNet is taking these intermediate feature maps and then it's doing an element-wise sum to produce the final feature map. So you can kind of see exactly how much each feature map is contributing to the final output. So that's what's shown here in across the different training iterations. So sort of what happens here is you can see that earlier on in the training, say the this is sort of the 128 by 128 feature map has more of a contribution to the output than it does towards the end of the training. So in this plot, they see that this 512 by 512 has a massive contribution to the output even at the end of their training. So this inspires them to scale up the architecture so that the images can really be true 1024 by 1024 compared to just sharpened versions of the 512 images. Another interesting thing they present in this paper is a deep fake detection algorithm by projecting these images back into the latent space. Their video shows an example of this idea of projecting these deep fake images back into the latent space. So shown on the left here are the target images. These are like the deep fake images. And the idea here is that you want to find the latent vector or the W vector that produced this latent image to kind of attribute the target image to the generative adversarial network and sort of saying that this is a deep fake because look, we found the latent vector in this network that produces this image. So then they show a contrary example of having real images that aren't deep fakes and showing that you can't find the latent vector that would produce these images. 
Although it's exciting that the addition to the perceptual path length normalization and having the smoother latent space in the StyleGAN version 2 enables this kind of projection from taking a generated image and then finding the latent vector that might produce it, I still think this is kind of a tricky thing and I'm not sure if this is the solution to deep fake detection. The thing that, that I, my sort of issue with this is how does it really attribute to the network? Is, isn't it more of a consequence of the data set that was used to train it? And the other thing is if you have the real data set in the GAN framework, won't all those images be evident in the latent space anyways? So it's sort of tricky to say that this kind of a thing can attribute any kind of a generated image as you know being generated. So this is definitely a hot topic with things like the $1 million prize and the Kaggle Deep Fake Detection Challenge, but I think a more interesting way that you know I don't think is gonna solve the Kaggle problem, but to sort of solve this problem is the solution that Ian Goodfellow describes in his interview with Lex Fridman about having this kind of a cryptographic signature of images that like you know come out of an iPhone or something like that. To recap the video, some of the key changes in the StyleGAN version 2 are to restructure the adaptive instance normalization using this weight demodulation technique, replace progressive growing with the skip connection architecture, and then using this perceptual path length normalization. Probably the perceptual path length normalization is the most interesting characteristic of the StyleGAN version 2, resulting in this much smoother latent space which creates these really cool animations and also improves the quality of the generated images. Also interestingly in the paper is the training speed gains that they cite. So in the StyleGAN version 1, they get these 37 images per second. Uh, the version 2, the E configuration has a 40% faster at the 61 images per second. And then when they use the larger networks, it's really not that much uh, longer to train these networks. And they cite that it takes them nine days using eight Tesla V100 GPUs on the FFHQ dataset and then 13 days for the LSUN car. If you're interested in training the StyleGAN version 2 model for yourself on your custom data sets, they also produce a lot of interesting uh, data about this in their GitHub repository. So things like the training time it would take for this image resolution on this GPU, you know, one GPU, two GPUs, and then sort of the memory that is required to train this model as well. Thanks for watching this explanation of the new StyleGAN model from researchers at NVIDIA. Hopefully it gave you a good overview of sort of what they've changed in this model and sort of this new smoother latent space to have this kind of an interpolation between different Z vectors to mix styles and to create these cool animations by just moving along the latent space Z and then not having the images change so sharply that you can have these smooth animations. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.